What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Joe Johnson Celtics Appreciation Show. It's uh, it's great to have you here with us. Another new addition to Celtics Beat. Adam Kaufman and Valenti back with us and uh, dressed for the occasion, obviously. And of course, our good buddy Keith Smith from Spot Track, from Celtics Blog, among other outlets. Of course, he does a whole lot of podcasting on his own, not always a guest, often hosting as well. So great to have Keith here with us. And uh, I promise as much as I would like to and as much as Keith may uh, may like to, although he's a better person than I am, I, I will I will refrain from any and all Spider-Man and Hawkeye spoilers. I want to, I won't, it wouldn't be kind. Don't worry, you're in good hands, but just know I saw them both and they were delightful and I know Keith has as well. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. They were both fantastic. I, I, uh, I've seen Spider-Man twice now, and I nice. really loved it both times. I had to go back for the second viewing just to catch all the things I missed. But sure. yeah, great, great. But we'll leave it there. I don't want to ruin anybody's uh, enjoyment, especially over the holidays. Where are we at with just... the Matrix, though? Anybody see the new Matrix yet? So I, I know it dropped oh, yesterday, yeah. and, and buddies of mine were just frantically texting me about it. Here's my, uh, I don't know, I, I guess it's like my hot movie take or whatever. Not a Matrix guy. For all the bad crap that I like that Hollywood has produced, and there's a lot of it, there are certain things that are just deemed really, really good that I weren't for me. And and I know they went kind of downhill. I don't know about the fourth one, but the second, third, they went kind of downhill after the first one. I really wasn't into any of the Matrix movies, Evan. I'm just disappointed, I guess. I mean, like the first one, <laughs> I love Keanu. I just, I don't know, something about Matrix. It didn't do it for me. Two, you know, look, they're, they're movies. They're there. Uh, they advanced the story, I guess. There are certain parts about both of them that I really like. Um, but the first one is iconic. I mean, it's an iconic movie. Even for, nine, I think it was 99, right? Like 1999, yeah. uh, pretty, like, groundbreaking. And then, like, the best part is, like, listening to Will Smith try and defend and turning down Neo in the <laughs> Matrix for Wild Wild West. Right. And he, like, the last video he did, he was like, look, they explained the way that like the Wachowski uh, 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 family like came to me with this idea and they were like, we want to do, you know, a 3d 360 camera thing of somebody like jumping in the air like this. And that's how they sold it to me. So obviously <laughs> I said, no, and it's gotta be the worst mistake. Well, I don't know. He made another mistake. I think too, uh, Will Smith, but it's gotta be the worst Multiple. mistake he's ever made uh, in his career. He actually, the other mistake I'll say he made, and now look, the, the movie wasn't quality. It's because he's not in it is not doing independence day two is a huge <laughs> blunder on his part. Uh, Cause that movie would have made a ton of money. It would have. First one was so great. I never even saw the second one. Oh, I didn't either. The first one is iconic though. You remember there, there, because I've seen the Will Smith stuff. There have been articles written about this and I just don't remember. So he was obviously going to be in the Keanu role. Who was going to be in the Lawrence Fishburne role? Oh, are you ready for this? Do you not know this? I do, and I just don't remember. Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer. Now, the question is, is the movie better with Lawrence Fishburne? And we'll make this quick because we have basketball time. <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne <laughs> we, we sure? in, in, in Keanu Reeves, or would it have been better with Val Kilmer and Will Smith? No, Will I think Smith. they went in the right direction. Hard question to answer. Because <laughs> is Mor- it? Fishburne's so good as Morpheus, and obviously yeah. Will Smith would have been unbelievable as Neo, but it definitely worked with Keanu so I don't know it's tough the only other thing I'm wondering from Keith and then we will actually do basketball so we'll do it very very quickly just because I mentioned Hawkeye and of course that just you know finished up it's it's run and the uh, MCU Disney plus TV shows we've had what five shows at this point between Hawkeye and obviously Loki and WandaVision and and Falcon and Winter Soldier and and if you want to include what if in there as well what are your power rankings how are you ranking these one through five real fast uh, that's a good question. Hawkeye, I think, is number one. And that might be recency bias, but I really enjoyed Hawkeye. I also really liked, uh, it, after that, it gets really hard for me because I, I enjoyed Loki quite a bit. I, I thought WandaVision, just the approach was really fun. Uh, what If is at the bottom for me. I'm just, I'm not a big animated superhero movie guy. I mm-hmm. did like Into the Spider-Verse, but I did, now I'm afraid that has ruined all other animated superhero <laughs> movies for me. But yeah, those other three, or yeah, the other three, you could put them in almost any order and I'm not really going to argue with you, but I'm also not the person asking this because I don't think Marvel has done anything bad yet. I think all of the movies are good. Even the ones that are lower, are, I think, are still good. I I enjoyed the entire run of the MCU TV and uh, uh, films. 
And if you stick around for the next hour and a half, we'll do more of this at the very, I'm just kidding. We won't, we won't. Let's get to basketball. Uh, I know the Celtics won their last game, which, uh, you know, as, as we sit here talking right now, that was last night edging Cleveland. These two teams going in had a combined 15 guys in health and safety protocols. Of course, you know, begging the ultimate question that we got into quite a bit with Sean Devaney last week. And we'll talk about you in a little while of should the, players that should the league should Adam Silver be doing this in the first place and that's something that he addressed during the week with ESPN but the big story the big takeaway last night was not the continued great play of Jalen Brown since returning from the hamstring injury it was Joe Johnson of course the backstory for anyone that missed it with all these guys in health and safety protocols teams given these 10-day contracts these hardship exemption opportunities Joe Johnson who was drafted by the Celtics 10th overall 20 years ago and was traded in February because of the insane impatience on the part of Rick Pitino and Johnson was not the only victim of that obviously goes on seven-time all-star you know an excellent career 20 plus points per game seven or whatever straight years that it was he was he was very very good had been in the big three league, hadn't played in the NBA since 2018, gets the 10-day contract, comes in to chance of we want Joe. Everyone all excited about ISO Joe, throwing it back to their childhoods. I was in high school, Evan probably in middle school at the time or, or elementary school for all I know. He's so young. And then Johnson comes in, final two minutes of the game, hits his only shot, old man jumper like you read about, just effortless and beautiful and terrific and now i want to know how we keep this guy around for the rest of the season keith <laughs> yeah it's it's funny that seems to be a prevailing take uh, this morning last night and into this morning really was how do we keep joe johnson all, all the time you hear the the guys coming back to the locker room and they're going crazy for him which is to be expected but then Jalen Brown talking about how like this guy, you know, I played with him over the summer, but I also watched him when he was with the Hawks when I was a kid and Jason Tatum apparently told me Adoka like he was really excited because Joe Johnson was one of his favorite players growing up. So yeah, my guess is what I've told people all along is for any single one of these guys, we're up to over 50 of them now that are on <laughs> these hardship uh, contracts. It's a 10 day audition to show what you can do. The vast majority of them will not stick around. They'll get sent back to the G League or sent back into semi retirement, at least like Joe Johnson was in. Or maybe a handful of them do show enough. And then teams say, well, you know, we get this other guy who's at the end of the bench that really doesn't fit what we need right now. Let's move on for him. And I know a lot of people are going to get Jabari Parker out of here. We don't need him anymore. Keep Joe Johnson. And I don't want to go quite that far because i think jabari parker has done some stuff um but i i can see the logic behind it if he continues to play well and seems to be a good locker room presence the reality is your 15th to 17th man depending on how you count the two-way players if you're really counting on all that much out of them you're probably not a very good team so you might as well do things that make the locker room a better place get guys a little bit in line the miami heat have done it for years now with Udonis Haslam sure. they keep giving him a roster spot because it's different when you're a player versus a coach you you're in the locker room with the guys when there's a players only meeting those guys carry weight and gravitas that that coaches are not there to be involved in so yeah maybe that that is what Joe Johnson becomes uh, for this team I will say this too I've had a lot of people say why not just dump Juancho Hernan Gomez and get him out of here mm. he doesn't do too much for the team uh, that becomes a cap thing he's a nice piece of salary matching in a trade where Jabari Parker's on a uh, minimum contract and you can move on very easily uh, Hernan Gomez is probably not going to be the cut at least not now maybe that's a post trade deadline kind of thing so I, I chuckle a little bit and this is just me like picking on your words but you said like if Joe Johnson continues to play well as we know I mean he played literally less than two minutes in his first game first action and in a few years as I mentioned takes one jumper it falls. It's great. Crowd goes Lead nuts. Leading league in field goal percentage. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, nobody's shooting better. It you know it, it couldn't have been a more beautiful situation. But I think the the more important thing, obviously, is is what you just acknowledged. It's not the on court. It's the off court, and it's the end of the bench. And you know, not to take anything away from how I don't know Jabari Parker could potentially help out. I mean, hell, if if he were not in COVID protocols right now and we're available now with Ennis Freedom and as you know formerly Ennis Cantor and his freedom going into COVID protocols earlier today if anybody missed that I mean a guy like Jabari Parker would actually get some run would get some usage and and that would be helpful but a Joe Johnson in terms of 
you know, what he can give that locker room, what he can provide just as a mentor for some of the younger guys. Again, not the on-court stuff. Let's not be delusional. But the rest of the way behind the scenes, you know, almost sort of providing an on-court version of what the Celtics hoped they were doing with Evan Turner when they brought him in as an assistant coach on Brad Stevens' staff. How, how much how much value is there in in realistically keeping him around? Not all of our fantasies, but realistically keeping him around for the duration to, I don't know, just help provide a little bit of what's clearly been missing from this team this year. Yeah, it's huge. I, I, again, I'll reference uh, Udonis Haslam in this because, but there's a, a section of Miami Heat fans that are like, what are we doing? Every year we waste a roster spot on this guy. Just make him a coach already. And what mm-hmm. I think people miss in that is it's just different. The minute you become a coach, the whole relationship dynamic changes because then the players see it as now your management essentially is, is what it becomes. And we, we've probably all held jobs, right? Where it's uh, your buddy who was your lunch pal and you hung out all the time and took long lunches, he gets promoted. And now all of a sudden he's the one who's like, Hey, you know, those long lunches can't really be doing that. And it's like, come on, man, you were, we, we did it together last week. And now here you are telling me, no, it's, it's a slightly different dynamic, but that's a lot of what goes into it. So absolutely. If they feel like what they're getting, from Joe Johnson as a locker room voice and presence is helpful, then it is absolutely something to consider looking at and saying, hey, we want to bring this in. I was also told directly, because people have said, you know, why did they sign CJ Miles and Justin mm-hmm. Jackson and Joe Johnson, guys who and have not been... Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> well, there's <laughs> been some of that for certain, sure too. But yeah. the thing missed with Isaiah Thomas is this all happened after yeah. the Lakers were already there. So they just maybe got beat to the punch. But and, but the reality was what I was told with those four guys, Justin Jackson's in a slightly different place, of course. He's only got four years in the league but johnson and miles was they know what the story is they know they're coming in here for probably 10 days maybe 20 if there's a need to keep them beyond that with no expectations of i'm gonna stick i'm gonna stay i'm gonna do all these things and there's a email you don't said we're, we're not looking for any projects right now we're not looking to bring these guys in we're like a team like orlando where i live they've pulled up all these guys from their g league team but they're also a team that's they're in the diamond mining process. So let's see if we can find somebody who can pop and things like that. We've also seen the Celtics aren't stocking Maine with young players. They're, they're generally going for guys that are a little bit more established. have a pretty good sense of who they are. Um, I well, think all if those main guys are getting jobs elsewhere anyway. Exactly. And I think, and I do think if they'd known where things were going, you might've seen one or two of those guys, maybe come back. He maybe don't get talked about that of like, Hey, they get snapped up and went somewhere. It's also on the players too, right? It's the, those guys are free agents. As far as the NBA is concerned, they don't have any loyalty to have to go to the Celtics. If they feel like, if you're Luke Cornett, my better shot to play and stick is in Cleveland, then go to Cleveland versus coming to Boston. But I think the main thing was the Celtics didn't need guys coming in who were trying to fight to stay on the roster and doing all this stuff. They needed guys who got it, knew what the story was, come in, do your thing for you know two, two and a half weeks, and on we go. Uh, Evan, I, I, I'm just curious, has Jonas Jerebko gotten back to you on social media <laughs> nah. as far as filling that opening created by Ennis Freedom's COVID case? No, nah, it's early, though. We'll see. Maybe he'll get back to me at some point. I mean, we had a little uh, fun with Keith earlier pre-show. It took uh, Jonas, like, what, a year and a half to get back to you on a certain thing, Keith? So <laughs> we're, we're, we'll hold our breath here, and we'll see what yeah, happens. Well, but, is P.J. Brown available? Well, hey, look. walking through that door? Somebody <laughs> has to. I Robert Parrish, he's finally going to do it. He looked pretty good in that <laughs> Christmas commercial. Right. Uh, it looks I like he's I'd, in playing shape. I just the idea yeah, how on Twitter up to. Well, yeah, right. Well, Perk's not doing He's doing a bunch of media stuff. He's not in shape, <laughs> right. so I, I wouldn't even try that. But I threw out the idea of, like, what – former Celtic would you like to have back on this team because like the Joe Johnson thing just made everybody feel great I love the Eddie House one because like you, they yeah. could use some shooting somewhere love Eddie and, House. And, and, out there like, in a gym somewhere playing pickup in a YMCA yeah I mean the guy game. as long as he doesn't trouble the basketball could really shoot was like if he took three dribbles and shot like it was never a, the results weren't as good but a catch and shoot <laughs> dynamo and a guy that probably played a little too early if he were in today's NBA it'd be a lot a lot different story uh, for sure. But I want to just touch on Joe Johnson and retain. Can, can, sorry, can I do, you do a quick Eddie House story? Go ahead. You can just tell as many funny. Eddie House stories as you want. Should I go upstairs <laughs> so, and get my Eddie House jersey? <laughs> Always. So during the 2008 title run, right? Remember that team? They had to fill out that <laughs> yeah, bench vaguely. on the fly because because they they made the kg trade at the end of july actually on my birthday july 31st uh they got me kg as a present so it nice. was uh 
they they had free agent market was picked over they, they got kind of lucky that james posey was in a contract standoff and and they got him and then filled it out and eddie house was one of the guys my wife became the biggest eddie house fan in the world <laughs> because of his son because his son if you remember was always running around on the baseline and he would run on the court during games yeah. and almost get knocked over and stuff and my wife just thought it was the cutest thing in the world so she loved eddie house so anytime he got in the game she i don't even know how much she was watching she was looking for where where's the son where's he at so yeah, uh, for, i think his son is playing in college now if i if i remember correctly right. which is absolutely wild stuff for our younger listeners, I mean, this this was Deuce Tatum before Deuce Tatum. It's exactly what I said in my head. I was yep. like, it's just Deuce Tatum all over again. <laughs> yep. uh, but uh, to the Joe Johnson stuff, like one of the things one of our very good guests, Gary Washburn, talked about pre this year was, you know, Brad needed guys on his staff that formerly played. And they solved that this summer, right? They brought in Damon Stoudemire and Adam, you and I were like, maybe the most two excited people in america about that can't believe we haven't tried to get him on the pod yet i know well hey maybe talk to jeff and figure that out i don't know what yeah so, um but uh you know Eme used to play obviously damon used to play um you know i don't i'll be honest with you i'd be shocked if if jalen or jason or you know anybody else in that team has vivid memories of watching damon sodemeyer play um <laughs> i'd be impressed by it to be frankly honest with you but the Joe Johnson thing, because I again, you listen to them back, talk about it last night, and I this 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 did not get by me, but it's like Jalen and Jason definitely grew up watching Joe Johnson play basketball, mm -hmm. and it's not like Joe Johnson was some scrub dude. Like Joe Johnson was an all star and was on a Hawks team that won what sixty plus games with Al Horford, and you know went to the Eastern Conference Finals with I with Boonholzer was coach back then, I think, right? when he was up, I think so I could be could be off on that but it, it's like a guy they remember playing I remember dominating the league and like again I love e to death and Damon Stoudemire rules but like Joe Johnson carries a little bit different weight than those two guys in my opinion because of the fact that they're two young star players I remember watching him I mean like having a guy like that on your bench and I'm not you know trying to hey, Jabari Parker's got to leave. I'm not going to sit here and pound the table for that, but I will say there is an advantage to having Joe Johnson around. And that is teaching your 23 year old and your 25 year old players a little bit more about routine, about what you need to eat, when you need to sleep. All, Cause again, Joe Johnson's 40 years old and playing in, you know, the big three league or whatever it is, and is doing, you know, somewhat well ish. Right. Um, and has highlights, you know, every summer and everybody goes crazy for the four point shot, whatever he's doing. Uh, it's, it's valuable to have a guy like him around. And I think because of the respect factor that he has, it might be, at least should be looked into keeping around. Cause again, he's not going to play. I mean, he's really not going to play unless it's garbage time. He's a human victory cigar. It's fantastic when he comes out because you know, that the game's in hand and he might shoot a few times and everybody wins. Right. I think there is, these guys could use a little bit of that nurturing from Joe Johnson. And I don't think it's a terrible, like, you know, Joe Johnson might show them one or two things that they could, you know, use in a game. It's not like Jalen and Jason don't have a library of things to look at or choose from in terms of like trying to figure out their game. However, you know, Joe Johnson's a guy that's been there, done that and scored in a variety of different ways. So he could maybe teach them a thing or two about, you know, uh, you know, some sort of move that they don't have yet. I mean, I, it, I see nothing but good value from this, in my opinion. And, 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 you know, again, I like Jabari Parker. So it's like Jabari Parker, who doesn't have any ACLs left, or 40-year-old Joe Johnson. So pick your one. And I, there's some, you know, there's some weight over here with Joe Johnson. That's all I'm saying. Oh, at the very least, it sure as hell the feel-good story of the season for the Celtics. They've needed something like this, Keith. Yeah, they just you, – you, I, I wrote it today in my takeaways for Celtics blog from the game – this team needed to have some fun. They, 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 it wasn't just about winning because clearly they need to get some wins too, but they needed to have one where they, they had fun and felt good. And there was a lot of stuff to really feel good about from that game. I thought Romeo Langford played great. Uh, yeah, we, we could go for an hour on his post defense as a six mm -hmm. foot four guard. Uh, I thought Aaron Neesmith hit some shots and looked pretty good. Pey Peyton Pritchard reemerging in the rotation and looking like a really good player again has been huge. And then, 
You get uh, Ennis, you know, sprinting the court for a dunk that nobody expected. I mean, that thing was crazy. I said that that was the one that kind of had the building swaying. And then Joe Johnson blew the roof off when when he got in the game and snaked his way into that jump shot. And that's huge because, you know, that's that that's the kind of stuff that that can carry a little longer because once you start having fun again, it just changes things when it becomes all right, we got to go and we won, but are we going to win again tomorrow? Like all that stuff. You, you got to have some fun with this stuff too. And my, you know, I took some heat on Twitter from folks because my thing was, I said, if the Joe Johnson signing, he's only going to play if things have gone really well or really poorly. <laughs> and people got really upset because they were like, how do you, you know, say this? This guy can still play. He can still shoot. And I was like, we literally have no evidence of that being true. He's been right. in the league since, you know, 2019. Uh, and then, he couldn't make the Pistons because he couldn't run full court. So I don't know that we're you know in a position to really assume much. It's that. So my whole thing was we can just have fun with it. And when he plays, this is great. Almost kind of like a different version of Taco in a sense of, you know, all right, you know, let's let's go. But there's you're not even wasting development time there. Or or anything a, like it's that. a version that can help you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you taking be, nothing. I mean, yeah. not deliberately you know, attacking Taco because sure. I mean, like find me a better human being, obviously like oh, Taco Paul seems like an incredible person. And, and yeah. look, he was on the other side st- starting for Cleveland yeah, last yeah. night. He actually played you know, pretty maybe, well. Yeah. I mean, maybe he can carve out a niche for himself. That would be great that, you know, obviously never materialized in Boston, but you know, what, whatever Joe Johnson does lack on the floor, you know, we've said this already, he can certainly more than make up for behind the scenes as a, a veteran, a guy who's been there, done that, yeah. as Evan talked about, you know, across the board and virtually every capacity available as a, pro, you know, an NBA pro and Taco Fall clearly can't do that. So, you know, while they're yeah. both sort of the human victory cigar, as, as Evan said, you know, in their own way, Joe Johnson's way more valuable. But exactly. going back Keith, to, to something that you talked about earlier, and, you know, I, I, I saw these comments from Ime Odoka pregame as well and talking about the Joe Johnson signing not wanting to bring in guys that that were projects and wanting to you know guys that that knew the deal knew the script knew the role knew the whatever you know I I think the bigger thing and I I don't know how much Udoka was asked about this is just you know the, the three guys that you just mentioned before like if there's any silver lining to what is happening with the Celtics right now with now eight guys in COVID protocols headlined of course by Horford Grant Williams Josh Richardson and now and his freedom is the fact that you actually have an opportunity where you are forced to play your younger guys that we have been clamoring to get a chance all season long. Like, I, I don't know what the hell, especially as another Portland guy, what the hell Peyton Pritchard did right <laughs> off the hop to get in, in Ime Odoka's doghouse versus the role that he had under Brad Stevens last year. But finally, 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 we're seeing this guy and you know, he has this, very obviously a renewed sense of confidence he's out there he's playing well he's you know scoring reliably he's shooting better he's he's giving you what he needs to give you off the bench that he did so often when you know like Kemba was down last year or Smart was out or whatever it was we're now seeing this and then you sprinkle in obviously Langford Neesmith like this is the opportunity this is the chance to see some of your younger guys develop that we have needed this year to see if you have anything there. I mean, we spent years, all right, do we have anything in Shemi Ojale and Carson Edwards and Gershon Yabuselli and like, you know, 10 other names that I won't bother mentioning only to find that we just, you know, they'd languish on the bench or they'd be forced into limited chances or they'd be given a second contract and none of them panned out because none of them could play. And for the most part, the guys aren't even in the league right now. These are guys that look like Keith. They have real potential. We need to see them. And I'm happy. I'm not happy people are, you know, potentially sick and in COVID protocols, but I'm happy that we are forced to see these guys play because it can actually help down the road. Yeah, I'm with you. I couldn't agree with you more. I think with Peyton Pritchard, I think it was this idea of we could play him and Schroeder together in the backcourt off the bench. And that's generally probably not going to work out too well, especially defensively. Pritchard, he didn't look good defensively early I think in the first couple weeks of the season too it just he he wasn't a pressure on the ball it just it just looked kind of messy so I think that's where where the 
decision was, all right, this guy's going to be out of the rotation. There's, there's this old, I think it was from the eighties. Uh, it's a basketball movie called one on one. I don't know if you've ever seen <laughs> it. it was, it's an awful movie, but, it, but the point I'm going to make off it is, is this, this kid goes off to a college. He's like a young, uh, like caught shot player as a freshman and he gets to college and he's not anything. And then the coach is mean to him and wants to take away his scholarship. So this kid in his last game is like, you know what? I'm just going to go out and do my thing. And he goes out and does his thing and plays great. And then coach gets fired, I think. And everybody loves the kid and he's probably a hero. So awful. It's a little movie. bit like mighty ducks three, actually. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, but my point was with that was I felt like that Portland game for Peyton Pritchard. He just went out there and said, you know, I'm just going to do my thing. I don't care if I piss people off. I'm going to shoot a whole bunch. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to be the guy I am. Uh, you don't get to where you are at his size without overwhelming athleticism to without being extremely confident. It's just something you have to have. It's it's almost like uh, I think about, about Isaiah Thomas with that all the time. If you're not extremely confident like IT is, you're not going to make it at that size. So I think Pitt Pritchard, that got him going. And now I think it was a rediscovery of, you know, I can play. I can I can do this. And now we're seeing a point where not only is he worth playing, but he can help this team. His spacing, because the fact is you have to guard him from 30 feet and in, maybe even 35 feet. That just opens up the floor big time for the rest of the guys. Langford's kind of two-way play, his ability to defend, defend guys who are bigger than him, uh, do some stuff. I think he might be the best cutter on the team, uh, which is, is big, especially if you're going to be working through Rob and Al a lot as passing big men. I think that, you know, is huge for the Celtics as well. And then Neesmith, we saw it last year as a rookie when he was not getting consistent time. He didn't look very good. I think he needs to play regularly to find a rhythm, feel pretty good out there and do his thing. And I thought, you know, this is huge for these three guys. Now, what happens when everybody comes back? I'm not going to say Josh Richardson shouldn't play because he obviously should. He's played very, very well for this team. But I think there are ways Ime Udoka can kind of relook at the rotation a little bit and say, all right, here's a way I can get to this, expand my rotation maybe some, and make sure I'm still getting Langford, Neesmith, and Pritchard time. That might mean playing 10 guys a night versus the eight and maybe even nine that he kind of likes. Maybe you play 10 guys a night and that's what you do uh, for a little while. Maybe there's a trade that, that frees up a spot that comes later down the line. But for now, yeah, I'm glad to see these guys play, but, but it's got to continue because they can help you right now. And there's going to be bumps for sure. But these guys are a big part of, if you're trying to surround Brown and Tatum with players that can play, you've got a bunch of cost control ones for at least a couple more years. You want to get them that experience to find out, can they be those role players on a very good team? Well, not only that, these guys, the Tatum and Brown need shooters, like just to space yeah, the floor. Big time. And like, look, I've kind of the table for Dennis as much as anybody. I'm sure that we might be able to get into a Dennis trade um, segment a little bit here. Uh, but like Schroeder is not as good of a three point shooter as Pritchard is. Pritchard extends the geometry way out beyond three point range. So if you're going to, and this is eventually where Boston, I think would like to go is to have both Neesmith or one of Neesmith and Pritchard out there with the Jays to give them more space to operate. That's why Al Horford being a good three point shooter is excellent for those two guys, because you know, again, if he comes out to the three-point line, the center just can't sag in the middle of the lane mm -hmm. and clog the paint. He's going to go out and respect Al. And if, you know, at, if uh, Jalen and Jason can expand their playmaking a little bit, there's a, you know, wide open three-pointer potential there with Al Horford. So, again, if ideally if those two guys are kind of what Boston needs, right, they need, a, they need two guys that can really shoot threes. And the hard part is, is watching Garrison Matthews shoot like a million percent <laughs> from three. Lights out. Like, with more opportunities somewhere else, like and that one, that one hurts too. So, you know, yeah, the COVID protocols has allowed these two guys to get some more rhythm and more run. And they've looked good in those times. It's just like, you know, at some point you got to be at the competition. And obviously with his prior history with Ime, Ime is going to go with Josh Richardson and Richardson has played mm -hmm. well, as Keith said, it's not like Richardson is playing terribly, but it doesn't allow for Neesmith to find any consistency. So basically Neesmith's got to be like, all right, yeah, let me come in and be unconscious off the bench every time you need me, which is like maybe three minutes a game once a week, which is like, yeah, how is anybody supposed to get any rhythm at all whatsoever doing that? I've, again, I, this team clearly 
is a, in the need of a trade somehow. They have to find a way to open up spots. The, the thing is, Dennis gives them something they don't have, uh, a guy that can routinely beat guys off the dribble. But Dennis does 18 other things a game that make you want to pull your hair out. And again, <laughs> I am slowly fading towards that side. However, I will. Well, he's keep... also not going to be back next year. So if you can get yeah. something for him. Right. That's 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 the idea there, too. So, I mean, I, I, I love Pritchard. His development last year was a huge storyline throughout the entire season. I mean, everybody and myself included, uh, you know, made a little Van Vliet ish, you know, kind of with the way he could come in off the bench and, and run an offense and, you know, occasionally throw up 20 points. And I'm not talking Van Vliet now. Van Vliet now is an unbelievable player. But early mm-hmm. Van Vliet, when, you know, we weren't sure what he was yet. Um, there's that kind of potential there. And Neesmith, the guy shot 50% in college from, you know, three point season, uh, three point range for half a season, which is small sample size. However, he did do it. So it's not like, you know, you, you, the, we have some sort of evidence that he is a good three point shooter. So again, those guys finding some rhythm would, would be huge. And if they can do it here would make Brad's life a little bit more difficult to try to figure out how to maybe open up a spot for them and make Emay's life a little more difficult. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. No, I definitely agree with that. The, uh, the, the other thing too, just cause uh, I don't know, I haven't kind of reminded me of this and, and also in, in its own way, it feels like it, it comes up every show as well. What is it Keith about? I know there are misses like there are, every team has them. This is not unique to the Celtics. Obviously it happens, you know, every year, every team, but, but there there's this run now of, of yeah, buts. And what I mean by that is, you know, a very specific singular roster transaction that has resulted one way for the Celtics and another way for the more successful outcome, which it, like there was Matisse Thibel, Desmond Bain, Garrison Matthews, like this, this series of yeah, buts in terms of guys that, you know, obviously, you know, Shin could Gu be helping being the Celtics. really good, by the way. Yeah. Uh, at, yeah not, not only like could be helping the Celtics, but should be helping the Celtics. And it, like, it, I, I, I don't know what, what do you make of, and I, I it's not an easy question to, to answer obviously it gets into a, a whole realm of paths obviously but you know the in in talking about the multiverse earlier and spider-man i mean what <laughs> what this alternate reality where these guys in particular you know are contributors to the celtics what what's going on in the decision making in the front office that says eh you know like we're, we're good on this path yeah i think it's one thing with with Danny was, I think it was this desire to contend now, but also stretch that window as long as you can. So there was always a, we're going to make a move, but we're going to make a move that gives us something now and something down the line. Mm -hmm. So even, even the Jason Tatum trade, as much as it was about, and I truly believe it was, we can get the guy we want anyway at three. So let's make that move down. It was also about, and get a first round pick later down the line. And then we saw that with, you know, other moves of we'll move this to get this and this and this and this. And I, and I think it was that, that, that kind of, that, that desire to keep moving things forward, but also let's have a stockpile for the future that caught them there with, with Brad in, in a situation like uh, Garrison Matthews, it's been well reported on now. Garrison Matthews basically said, I'm not doing a two way. And I think that was very much the Celtics hope was he'll take that second two-way spot and that that'll be our, our, our two-way guy and off we'll go. Uh, And I think he was, nope, I I started for a playoff team in Washington. Like I'm not a two-way guy. If I got to take a two-way, I'm going to do it where I think I really have a chance to make it made the right decision because clearly cracked the rotation in Houston. The yeah, but question there is, should they have kept them over Jabari Parker? And I think that was more of a look of, all right, we think we maybe have enough shooting with some of these other guys if they come through. We have Sam Hauser's already a kind of that's what he is as a designated shooter. So that's probably where we're gonna go. Let's keep Jabari as his size and his experience and can do some stuff in the front court for us. And that, that'll be what we'll do. And I think there might have been a little from our Jabari Parker kind of good in a couple of playoff games. There might have been a little bit of all right, hey, he did it in the playoffs. You know, maybe we can keep this guy around. And and that's probably what, what factored into it. But I think the bigger thing, what you said is, it's so true when you say every team has these. Because if you pop, pop on Twitter and just say, hey, what was your team's biggest kept this guy over this guy or made this trade and shouldn't have made this trade and those kind of things. And they'll tell you, it's like the one that kills me right now is the Desmond Bain, one that everybody is screaming and yelling about. 
that wasn't Desmond Bain was drafted by the Celtics. He was never drafted for the Celtics. Right. That pick was prearranged to go to Memphis in that deal, which was done to clear roster spots and cap and tax space and moving around in a way that they felt they needed to at the time. So that's not one where it was like they picked this guy and trade. It's really the same thing with the thigh bowl. Uh, trade mm-hmm. that was already a prearranged agreed to trade of we're going to draft this it's you know i like to call it draft hat silliness because that's yeah. what happens as you know they're never going to the team but i get it people look at it and say man we could have had had this guy and that and i think i do think it's uh you know brad's learning on the fly here and and i think there was a little bit of overlooking the importance of shooting i i, I think there was a little bit of well, we really like the way this has come together. So we're, we're, we, we think we've got enough shooting and to Evan's point is you need guys who can open the floor for Tatum and Brown. Cause that's, that's, we see they're just better when they can put the ball on the deck, get into the paint, make something happen. Even Marcus smart when they have enough shooting on the floor, that's all he does. He's just driving, kick, driving, kick when they don't have enough shooting on the floor. That's when you very much see him say, I need to be the guy who's going to take shots here. And that's just, and it doesn't work out as well. All right, Keith, we've only got you for another, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. There are a couple things I want to make sure that we hit on. One, going back to something that Evan brought up before with Dennis Schroeder, doesn't specifically have to be about Dennis Schroeder, but overarching thoughts on, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now with this team, very middling, very mediocre, very, again, middle of the Eastern Conference, basically, you know, it's a, it's a 500 squad. It's been a 500 squad because there's no sustained run of excellence. There's no prolonged rut. They just, this is who they are. And a lot of it, is we talked about this pre-show tough to really gauge who and what this team is and can be with so many guys whether it's injuries or health and safety protocols consistently out of the lineup a lot like last year in some ways even though obviously the roster in many ways looks very different this year so as we get toward the trade deadline it's it's not too far away in the grand scheme is this team a buyer or a seller i think they're going to be a buyer because i think when we get past january 1st the schedule starts to lighten up and, and it's just the law of averages says they have to be healthier. Like you, you just, think. You, you, it, it's just got to happen at some point. Right. It's a, I, I know I wouldn't bank on it cause it's been about a decade of this. It feels like, <laughs> uh, but it's, it, I mean, it just tells me that they've got to be healthy at some point, but I think the schedule lightening up, I think some of the kids finally finding their footing this at this point, I think they will be a buyer, but what I think instead of being a buyer around the edges, like what they've been the past three, four seasons of we're going to add a player, but probably not a massive upgrade. We'll, we'll, we tend to do the big stuff in the off season, which is true of just about every team. It's hard to make big trades. I think what you may see them do is say, well, we've got this trade exception yet again, so we can <laughs> use that. Uh, that may be something where they use it like they did last year of we're going to bring in a guy and then that guy may leave and we flip that into a yet another trade exception and go and that's just <laughs> asset management yeah. but i think you may see them look to say or what can we do with dennis Schroeder? is there a, a spot to move him for a player who can help us better somewhere else on the roster can, can we get another big could we get a wing and could we get a shooter from a team that maybe needs a point guard or some cre- on ball creation ability and those kind of things and i think the the other place i would look is wancho hernan gomez he, he's essentially an expiring contract because next year is fully non-guaranteed seven million that's a nice piece of salary matching uh josh richardson the way he is played you would think they wouldn't trade him but if you could if you put him schroeder in in hernan gomez together that's well over $20 million and you're in the market for just about anybody who will reasonably become available. So I think they're going to be active. Brad has already shown he'll make big moves. He's done it already a couple of times, the Kemba for Al trade and then going getting Richardson and uh, waiting out the market and landing Schroeder late. Um, those things are out there. And I think that, but the bigger thing for me is Richardson got the extension. So we know he's under contract for next year. Hernan Gomez, I just said, he's essentially an expiring and then he's not, Hernan Gomez is not going to be back next year because they're just not going to pay him $7 million to just be at the end of the bench. And then Schroeder's not going to be back, presumably because he should be able to get more than the maximum of $7 million that the Celtics can give him. Some teams should need him. And by the trade deadline, there's always some team that is point guard needy out there that needs help. So I think you have to be aggressive. Now, if they play really, really well over the next month and they look great, 
and it's like, well, maybe things break right. This team can make a run at, you know, the East finals or something like that. Then maybe you don't do anything except minor moves around the edges again. And you say, we're going to keep, but I think if there's the opportunity to be a big buyer, I think we'll see it. And I don't think we're going to get the, well, you know, we're in on that guy in close stories, which, you know, quite frankly, Danny Ainge knew was a joke and leaned into by the end of his tenure. Cause he, he'd bring it up before anybody else ever thought to, but I think you're going to see Brad Stevens be aggressive. Cause I think that's just kind of the nature of, hey, if we can make moves, we're going to make moves. If we think that's what improves us right now. Last thing I've got for you here, and then uh, if Evan has anything, by all means, but obviously dozens of players across the NBA just in December alone have entered health and safety protocols. It's been a theme throughout this show, recent shows, we've talked about it, but again, bigger picture stuff. You finally had Commissioner Adam Silver, the NBA, come out, talk to, you know, one-on-one Malika Andrews on, on her show on ESPN for, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. Uh, asked very logically and uh, you know doing her job she asked a lot of good questions uh, you know chief among them obviously is are you going to follow the nhl's league and uh, lead and, and have a you know a holiday shutdown or or any sort of shutdown just to sort of pause what is going on with with you know each team on average having like a dozen guys ruled out every game because of health and safety protocols and he diplomatically and respectfully basically said, what are you stupid? No, of course, the light, there's no chance in hell we're doing that. You know, we, we got these Christmas games that we're worried about. This is, you know what kind of money is, is, is on the table? The NBA is not going anywhere. And so, you know, what, what is the future here? Is this just the NBA trying to force its way to, to a full season, not having any games lost and, you know, whatever will be, will be along the way. It, should the league and, and you're someone who on social media has been very vocal about, you know, things related to COVID, especially because you are in Florida where things have, you know, run amok from the very beginning. So, you know, what's your outlook on what the league should be doing right now? Yeah, I'll start with, cause I think it's what most people probably know me for is yeah. I wrote about the bubble. Yep. I, it's we're not having another bubble, no chance that is ever going to happen again. That was a unique positioned thing where the league needed it. Disney had the ability to do it and off we went. Disney is going to open their, all of their hotels, but one are now open. And I can tell you by living just off property and seeing what it's like down here this week of Christmas, they're full. I mean, it is packed full with people down here and it's crazy. And that's, we can get in a whole, whether that should be or not, that's a whole (laughs) other story. Um, Maybe that's a whole different podcast probably, but there's not going to be another bubble. The players hated it. The coaches hated it. The staffs hated it. Nobody wants to do that again. That's not going to happen barring you know things really turning sideways and the whole world shuts down again now with that said adam silver i think was very honest and candid of what's the science to shut down versus what's the science to then restart well what what do you pick Well, well what are your numbers you say Tell us we should shut down whether in the league or in society is in general. Uh, what do the, the numbers have to be to say, okay, go ahead and restart? I think he was honest about we need to learn to live with this. And I am not somebody, as you said, I'm not somebody who's like, well, it's just here, throw your hands up and everybody's got to toughen up and figure it out. It's not it. Cause then I also agree with Adam Silver. He pushed the players aren't vaccinated. We want them to get vaccinated. You know, but also recognize them. They're 97%. That is way beyond the general population's mm-hmm. percentage. Also saying they're at 65% of eligible players have been boosted and saying, we got to get that number up and pushing. We got to get more guys to get the booster shot when they can. I think what he's basically come out and said is we're going to push through this because we have tools to make it easier to push through with. And that's what, what we're going to do. I'll also say too, is it got kind of skipped over. He very clearly said, I think it was three or four different times. Every decision we make is made with the Players Association. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of players want to continue to play. They are the ones who are pushing the shortened timelines and are screaming and yelling about, I feel fine. Why can't I play? You see it every day on social media. Some player is free me. I feel good. Let me play. This is silly. I I don't want to sit out. You know, I feel great. Uh, There's a bunch of them now that are taking to why can the NFL play, but we can't. Yeah. You have a few on the other side and it's freedom. One of them saying we should be shutting down and all these other things, but those are very few and far between the vast majority of the players want to play a lot of that. Sure. It's financially motivated. Absolutely. They know there's millions to billions of dollars on the line because the other thing is postponing games 
as they already have. The, I think we're up to eight or nine postponements now. That's a challenge that they're going to have to figure out. But you shut down the whole league for two weeks, like people were throwing out there. One is, what's that going to do? This isn't going to go away in two weeks. And then those, those don't become postponements. Those are cancellations. You're not going to be able to make them up. This is not like last year where you had – a million buildings open all over the league with a ton of open dates and nothing was going on. There's concerts, there's funny shows, there's events in these buildings, there's circuses, there's all sorts of stuff happening in these buildings along with the hockey teams are playing. And when people compare it to the NHL, the NHL was very open and a big part of their challenge was crossing the border back and forth. They have a lot of teams in Canada and that was getting increasingly difficult difficult it was going to be even harder to continue to do so it's it's not an apples to apples comparison here it's the same as it's not apples to apples with the with the nfl but i think what we're really looking at is this is uh making probably really terrible lemonade out of some spoiled lemons and you're just just going to make 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 the best of it and, and, and run with it as best you can because there's just not really a better option right now well, and the other thing that hasn't been said, too, is one thing that's going to happen way before a league pause or shutdown is reduced capacity in the stands. Right. And we're still at full capacity in every arena. So just that's not about, happening. Yeah. Anytime. yeah, just about. Yeah. So that's not happening uh, anytime quickly either. Before we go, have any parting thoughts? Happy holidays, everybody. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Hope you had a great Hanukkah. If that's what you celebrate, obviously, Happy New Year. Happy everything. We hope um, first and foremost, stay safe. Stay with your family. Have a great time. And uh, Celtics beat uh, continues on next week after Joe Johnson drops 20 in a game uh, in, in Milwaukee. Thank you to our partners, our sponsors, and everybody else for listening. We will catch you again real soon. Thanks to Keith. Thanks to Evan. I'm Adam. We'll see you later. 